Alrighty, welcome back. We just talked about all of the changes that are going on around college football. Did not get to all of them because it might just be physically impossible, but um, got to a ton of them. So if you want to see all those changes, definitely check that out. Um, and now let's talk about some of the most pressured individuals going into 2024. There are tons of guys that have a lot on their shoulders. Um, and let's start with a couple of the obvious ones, if you will. Uh, Kalen DeBoer, this is a duh. Uh, that's literally the first bullet point I wrote down for this one. He's taking over for a guy that was essentially the sport for a really, really long time in Nick Saban, and it's always going to be tough, right? There's no reality where you walk into a job after someone like Saban has left or down the road, whoever takes over for Kirby Smart at Georgia. It's going to be a nightmare. Uh, I won't lie to you. It's it's going to be a lot of long hours, a lot of really tough uh, things to figure out. But just on top of that, just to add to DeBoer's craziness that he's had to deal with, is he's taking over a job that has had infinite amount of staff changes, tons of roster changes. Um, it's been really hard for him to, you know, really get comfortable because he's constantly putting out fires, constantly trying to fit in guys uh, that they absolutely need. They got Keon Saab in the portal. That will not be the last guy they get in the portal, I don't think, um, throughout this process. But he's basically been dropped into a very, very tough situation. And every single day, it feels like the situation gets a little bit tougher and a little bit tougher, which is um, obviously not what he's uh, wanted. And I think he's very excited of pretty much anyone in the country to get to spring ball and to be coaching football again and to be on the football field because I think he has kind of gotten a little bit tired, uh, I'll be honest, of doing all of the stuff but coaching football. So I think he's very excited to get back to that. And I think another factor in all of this pressure that is building up around him and his OC, Nick Sheridan, who was elevated after Ryan Grubb left, tons of pressure on him to make this this offense work with Jalen Milrow coming back. But another factor to be put into this is Alabama fans have been spoiled. Um, they will tell you that, I'm sure. Uh, it is no secret across the country. Nick Saban has absolutely spoiled these people with national titles left and right, with SEC championships, with basically just expecting to beat everyone on the schedule every single year, which is not a realistic thing for 99% of teams in sports. So uh, it has been a wild time in Tuscaloosa. And with that comes somewhat unrealistic expectations. I'll be honest. I think um, while Alabama fans will try their darndest to not put as much pressure on Kalen DeBoer as they did on Nick Saban to always be in the mix, to always win 11, 12 games, to always um, be fighting for a national title, I think it's going to be really hard not to, right? Uh, they have Georgia coming to town um, early on in their conference schedule, and if that goes the wrong way, you will see a lot of upset Crimson Tides fans very quickly. Um, so how does he deal with all that will be a huge part of not only 2024, but moving forward, how can he kind of subside all of the fans worries about maybe his you know ability to to do this job because if he stumbles a little bit they will be on him very very quickly I promise you that so tons on his shoulders he might be the number one guy that is in the, under the most pressure just because of the position he's in uh taking over for the greatest coach of all time and Nick Saban um another duh is uh Sharon Moore Obviously, taking over for Jim Harbaugh is really, really tough. Taking over for Jim Harbaugh after a national title is particularly tough because the last, however, I think six national title teams have had the most players drafted and have had the most players leave for the draft. He, uh, Michigan has the most players uh, invited to the NFL Combine with 18. So just to give you an idea, he has to take over for one of the better coaches we've had in the sport over the past couple of years. He has to replace a ton of really good defensive coaches in particular, but also some you know special teams coordinator in Jay Harbaugh that went to Seattle. And he's got to do all of this while also putting together a 
national title defense run, which is not an easy thing to do. I think we saw in 2022, I think uh, Georgia made it look relatively easy. Uh, And then they had to play Ohio State, and you realize, man, these guys have been giving absolutely everything all year, and that was an absolute dogfight was probably the best game of all of that year, and uh, it's incredibly hard to repeat. It's incredibly hard to even get your guys up to, you know, be back in the Big Ten Championship after this year because of the amount of people they're losing, but the talent is still very much there. They hired Wink Martindale as their defensive coordinator. It will be a very interesting thing to watch because his time in the Giants was not necessarily his best, but obviously a very, very smart guy that's been around football for a very, very long time. So I have full confidence that he'll be able to make that that defense work, even with all the departures that have happened. And then they got to face Texas week two. So he's another guy that will be under a spotlight very early on against a very, very good team in Texas. So it's going to be a tough draw for Sharon Moore. I really like him. I think he's very, very good. Um, But the question is, how does he adapt to this, you know, crazy change in roster, in coaching, in possibly philosophy going forward? There's tons of different things to come into uh, play here, and Sharon Moore's got to balance all of it. So right up there with Kalen DeBoer is Sharon Moore taking over for um, two just legends of the game in a lot of ways. Um, But let's get to a couple of quarterbacks here. And let's start with Quinn Ewers, uh, a guy that did not go into the NFL draft. Um, Now, he wasn't necessarily going to be a part of that top three, the Caleb Williams, Drake May, Jaden Daniels group. But I I think anyone that has been following the draft has seen it's pretty much those three guys and then a big gap. Uh, There's a big question mark at at quarterback four. There's tons of people being thrown out there from Michael Penix to... Uh, J.J. McCarthy to maybe even Spencer Rattler. Tons of guys that could find their way into that four spot. And I don't think Quinn Ewers would have been necessarily any different if he had pulled the trigger, gone into the uh, NFL draft, gone through a combine, gone through a pro day. His arm talent is very obvious. His, His ability is very obvious to throw the ball. So I think he would have gotten a lot of teams' eyes. I think he would have... Um, possibly even found his way into the first round because of the craziness going on uh, on around the quarterback position and three guys possibly be taken one, two, and three, he could have been right there. Um, But the reality is he came back for a reason. He came back because he wants to win a title. He was right there. They were a play away from beating Washington, and then who knows what happens in the national title game. So he very obviously wants to win a title. He wants to be the guy that brings... Texas all the way back, not just, you know, that was a fun season, uh, let's see what happens next season type of thing. He wants to be the guy that lifts the trophy for them, and I think that's very clear. So him coming back is a message not only to Texas fans and to, you know, the SEC, but college football as a whole. And I think he's going to have a really good season in 2024. If he can follow it up with possibly even a trip to NYC after a really good 2023 campaign, he might just be up there for the number one pick. I think he'll be battling Carson Beck pretty much all year for that spot, and it'll be interesting to see how that works out. And then I don't love addressing this because I don't think it'll play much of a part in the season, but if he does struggle, people will be talking about Arch Manning. That is a layer of this that you you have to at least touch on, and um, although it's a little goofy and it probably won't matter, um... It is something that will happen, and it's something he will have to deal with. And then we got Will Howard, uh, the quarterback at Ohio State. This really just all comes back to Ohio State has been littered with incredible quarterbacks, C.J. Stroud, Justin Fields, uh, tons of guys. I can't even – Dwayne Haskins. There's a million incredible uh, quarterbacks that have come through Ohio State. And then last year was a little bit frustrating from that position. Kyle McCord just not playing as consistent of football as they would have liked. So Will Howard has tons of pressure on him from the Ohio State fan base to be that guy, to be the guy that they brought him in to be, which is a guy that can just execute everything around him. And he'll have tons of, you know, toys to play with, obviously, a Mecca Ibuka, 
uh, Brandon Ennis and Carnell Tate are wildly talented. Jeremiah Smith coming in as the top weight of, uh, wide receiver. It's just insane. And then you add in the running backs. It's it's a embarrassment of riches over there. So he should be able to execute. He is an efficient guy. Having uh, Chip Kelly in his corner now can only really help the situation. And then I think the question is, you know, if he starts to struggle, if the first couple of weeks aren't quite as smooth as Ohio State fans would have liked, what does that conversation look like uh, in that, you know, locker room or on the Twitter, uh, you know, pages or especially in those uh, message boards that people get a little bit rowdy in uh, around the season time? It'll be interesting to see how he handles all the, the pressure that not only comes with just being the Ohio State quarterback, but especially after the year that they had um, with Kyle McCord a year ago, they need better quarterback play um, from Ohio State. They need the the quarterback play they're used to. Um, and the guy that I tend to believe might be under the most pressure going into this year is Ryan Day. Um, and there's a number of reasons for this. Uh, I think, namely, what everyone knows, he has to be Michigan. Um, there is no two ways about it. He literally cannot lose that game. I think he could genuinely go 11 and 1 up to that game. If he loses that game and let's say maybe doesn't even get into the Big 10 championship because of that, I think he's out the door. And maybe that's a little bit uh hasty, maybe that's a little bit ridiculous to think an 11 and 1 season would not do the trick, but that's the game. That's the game that you have to win. It's the same problem that Will Howard's going to have to have. You have to win that game. Uh So Chip Kelly needs to hit. He needs to get into the playoff. He needs to compete for a Big Ten championship. There are tons of things that are on the checklist for Ryan Day going into 2024. And on top of all this, uh, just to add to the fun for him, Ohio State just brought in the new uh, athletic director from Texas A&M, Ross Bjork. And Ross Bjork is a good um, athletic director. I think he'll be successful at Ohio State. But one thing about him that is absolutely true, that will always be true, I'm sure, is he is not afraid to spend money. He is not afraid to go after the big fish. He obviously hired Jimbo Fisher during his time at Texas A&M after getting rid of uh, Kevin Sumlin. And then he hired Buzz Williams uh, for a ton of money uh, to coach their basketball team. So he's not afraid of letting go of a coach that... um, might be, you know, right around where they want to be, but not over the top and then going all in on a new guy. So Ryan Day has to execute this year because I think if he doesn't, it's going to be tough. Uh, Obviously, giving up play calling duties will help him a lot, um, but he's got to be closer to that Urban Meyer role where kind of the GM over the team, the, the real head coach, you know, not having to worry about game planning, not having to worry about that type of stuff and just kind of let him be him. Um, and it'll be really interesting to see how this goes because every single week is going to matter for Ryan Day. If you lose to Rutgers in the middle of the season, it's going to be a problem, and the AD is going to be watching you very closely. So uh, Ryan Day might be the most pressured individual in the entire uh, country going into next year. Um, but that's all I have in terms of players and coaches under a ton of pressure there are still plenty more Billy Napier is one that I wrote down here just didn't have quite enough time to get to him but he's someone to watch Uh, I'll put it that way he is someone that could be up against it especially with the schedule they're facing but um, that's all I have for the time being definitely we'll revisit this because there are a lot of people under pressure Um, there are a lot of people that have to deliver this year or they could be looking for a new place to live uh, around December. So it'll be interesting to see how all of that develops. But we will be taking a short break, and then we're going to come, da- come back with Spotlight Wednesday. And it is Miami Hurricanes time in the spotlight. We are going to talk about their outlook for the 2024 season, what kind of stumbled them up in the 2023 season, and just my general thoughts on what I think they're capable of doing uh, in the 2024 season. But Stick with us, and we will be right back.